If you'd stand out in a star pose, completely naked, and watch the sunrise, you'll be a superhuman for the rest of the day. I'm gonna try this tomorrow morning. <laughs> Can you be naked though? Yeah, 100%, dude, fuck it. <laughs> it's like trails and blazes with the metal gang rocks, sticking labels and lists on. Fake ladies and males get their shit on. Made up and murdered like women gliding with their wings gone. Yo, what's up? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I am Troy Polidori. And it's time, people. It is time for another parliamentary book club. That Finally. is right. Finally, huh? It's, God, I bet it's been six months? Eight months? What Dude. was the last book we did? Uh, was it G.A. Cohen? That was the longest time ago. I didn't even live in the same place I live now when we did that. Gosh, I don't even remember. No, no, no. It was, um, it was Dan Barber. Ah, oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we did That also Prozorov. feels like it was 10 years ago. Dude, it, it, <laughs> it, it was 10 years ago. Wait, oh, should we just gosh. do Zizek's book on the pandemic instead? Yeah. <laughs> Oh God, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure that if if you gave me a couple keywords, I could just tell you his argument from yeah, exactly. <laughs> I could reconstruct it from previous books. No longer is this Owls at Dawn. This is the speculative reconstruction of Zizek's past, present, and future works based on select keywords from what we understand of Zizek's entire project. I'm and pretty I sure. Bet you I'm pretty sure. Eighty percent, ninety percent accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure with our, our rudimentary coding knowledge, we could we could, we could like construct an AI that could build up a new Zizek book based upon any cultural phenomenon. Oh, a thousand percent, a thousand percent, easy peasy, man. Um, okay, well, do you want to tell people what it is that we're actually going to be going through this episode? Yeah, so we're going to start a book club on Marcus Gabriel's Fields of Sense. Um, we'll put, I guess we'll talk more about Gabriel and who he is and why we wanted to pick the book uh, when we start talking about it. Um, in the main segment, but uh, we definitely recommend if you want to follow along with us to get a hold of the book and, and join in the reading of it before um, engaging in the episode. Yeah, and to give you just a little bit of a teaser, uh, is it the subtitle that is towards a new realist ontology? Is that what yeah, something like that? Something like that, a new realist ontology, and this is a book engaging with the kind of decades-long, centuries-long debates between realism and anti-realism, right? So we're going to talk about all kinds of themes that really cover um, a huge historical uh, swath of philosophical debates. It's basically, it kind of goes to the crux even, you might say, of um, some of the central questions of philosophy itself, questions about metaphysics, ultimate reality, questions about being... <clears throat> Questions about knowledge, how we know things, or maybe not how we know things, but uh, in what ways we know things, if we know things, to what extent do we know things, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's going to be dealing with a lot of these questions, and I'm really excited to get into this um, with T. Roy here, especially since he engages a lot with um, what is sometimes called analytic philosophy, even though we'll probably talk about this in the introduction. He kind of just destroys the bifurcation between analytic and continental philosophy. Um, but uh, he engages with figures of the analytic tradition as smoothly as he weaves them together with engagements with the uh, figures in the continental tradition. So I'm really excited to kind of get into this here, especially with kind of Troy's expertise uh, in analytic philosophy. It's going to be really helpful for me. Yeah, and I mean, um, I'm really excited about even maybe more so than the arguments about, you know, uh, fundamental ontology and stuff like that is how he's going to go about methodologically using, you know, 20th century analytic philosophy. And then he also says in the preface that he sees this work as being kind of in, in the tradition of German idealism. And uh, you don't necessarily usually see those uh, two things together. Like you don't see uh, Kripke um, and Lewis and then German idealism <laughs> mm. often put together. So, and you know, we certainly want to be um, following a path of like methodological integration, right? Where we think, you know, philosophy is not necessarily these two bifurcated schools that don't have any ability to talk to each other. And so seeing how he's going to do that is going to be, I think, um, one of the more exciting um, parts of the project. 
cool. Yeah, so this week we're going to go over the introduction, and then we basically, sporadically, like every other week or maybe every every uh, couple weeks, we will then pick up a new chapter. It gives us time to like kind of slowly and patiently work through the sections, but it also gives you guys a little bit of a break from just, uh, you know, like a philosophical read of a text every single week. So we'll do some other stuff just for new listeners who aren't familiar with how we do the book clubs. So yeah. Yeah, this is going to be probably the heaviest um, work that we've done, I think. Um, maybe Prozorov's was, but even the so that was um, as heavy as that was, uh, I don't think it's going to be quite as detailed in the argument, the argumentative level as this book will be. So it might be a bit of a slog at certain points, but we'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. Indeed. So if we don't make, you know, like a dick joke somewhere in the middle, then just let us know and we'll try and make up for it. Yeah, we got a quota to live up to, so we'll, we'll have to make sure that happens. So um, also just want to give you guys a reminder that if you want to support us, uh, we'd really appreciate it. You can go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn. We do have bonus content there as well. If you become a patron, uh, bonus episodes, newsletter, and the ability to recommend topics for future episodes. We actually just did a couple episodes ago, the last patron chosen topic on the politics of uncertainty versus a poli- I'm sorry, the politics of certainty versus a politics of uncertainty. That was something that you all chose. So if you want to have a say in what we talk about in the future, uh, definitely make sure you head over there. One of the tiers gives you access to that. Um, Actually, I think all of the tiers give you access to that one. Um, And then uh, there's another tier where you can get access to bonus content and shit like that. And we will be doing a bonus episode here as well in the coming weeks, a new one. We haven't done one of those in a while. So we'll pull something together for that as a nice little extra little treat for the patrons. So you can go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn to become a patron. That's patreon.com slash owls at dawn. Yeah, yeah. All right, it's time to kick things off with the shitty minute. This is where one of us gets to rant and rave about something that is ticking us off. It's how we prime the pumps for all of our episodes. Gets the shit off of our chest. Gets it out of our bowels, our psychological bowels, so that we can proceed into the main segment. So, Troy, it's your turn to cleanse yourself. What's up, dude? So you heard this story about the real life Lord of the Flies? No. So you know who Rutger Bregman is? Uh, is is that the like the Dutch um, yeah dude that got into a fight with Tucker Carlson or whatever? He writes on like Utopia and shit. Is that the guy? Yeah, exactly. And he had got kind yeah, of yeah. famous last year because he went to uh, Davos or whatever and called out a bunch of rich assholes for being rich assholes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he became a, kind of a celebrity on the left, um, and maybe the center a little bit too, um, last year. Um, but he wrote a story in The Guardian last week, I believe it was last week, maybe a little bit before that, about the real-life Lord of the Flies. And the, the story was that there's these um, group of um, boys who, they're from somewhere off the coast of Africa, um, Southeast Africa, bordering into like somewhere maybe in like Western Indonesia, I can't remember exactly where it was. Um, and they had gotten, they like stole a boat because they wanted to go and have some fun and they ended up getting stranded on um, some deserted island and everyone thought they were dead and they survived for um, like a couple of years or something. Hmm. There were funerals held, everyone expected them to be to be dead and then um, some uh, like boating captain happened upon them and they had like, against the like classic story of Lord of the Flies, right, where the kids end up um, you know, fighting and destroying each other and kid die. And it's supposed to be this, you know, you're, you're like taught it in ninth grade or whatever as this uh, tale of why society is so important or, um, you know, the war of all against all, like a Hobbesian point about individuals absent the social contract to just destroy each other, right? And that's not the way to live or whatever. Um, and so this is supposed to be a story about well, these kids actually banded together. They like built a gym. And they built weights out of stuff they found, like sticks and stones and <laughs> fruits and shit. Um, one kid broke his leg, and then they actually like set it, and he healed perfectly. Oh. Um, really amazing story. So it's in the Guardian. It's called "The Real Life Lord of the Flies" by Rucker Bregman. It's a wonderful little article, um, and they're gonna for sure make a movie out of this because it went kind of viral last week, and it's prime for a movie adaptation. Mm. Um, and so I love the story. I mean, it's a fantastic, heartwarming story, right? But the kind of shittiest part of it, and I kind of want your take on this because I'm not positive that my take is correct, right? I'm just kind of having a gut feeling here. And the shitty minute's about gut feelings, so it's okay. That's right. Um, 
I read The Lord of the Flies in high school and I really loved it. And part of that probably came from the fact that I had this like, you know, kind of Christianized view of like original sin as being the ultimate fact of humanity or something like that, right? Mm. And so I think that when I remember the the sort of lesson that I took from Lord of the Flies wasn't the Hobbesian one. Right? I think the Hobbesian one is, is the is the wrong take, right? Ultimately. I, you know, the Hobbesian take is something like, you know, human beings left on their own are you know non-altruistic they're only self-interested and so if you don't have this sort of like leviathan figure or society or some sort of um group formation to hold people or keep people in check they'll just destroy one another and it'll be chaos and then no one gets what yeah. they want ultimately so it's a kind of a tragedy in that sense um that's wrong for all many reasons which go back and listen to the last 125 whatever episodes of this podcast we constantly rail against um that sort of uh, view of humanity and so forth. Um, the take that I got, and I think that's somewhat historically backed up by William Golding's um, own kind of words. I don't think he he wanted the book to be taken that way. Golding himself was a Christian, and I don't think he thought of original sin as being in line with that kind of Hobbesian take on human nature. Instead, from what I remember, Golding um, wanted to sort of satirize the sort of British the sort of notion that the British culture was such that it could improve humanity on its own. Mm. It was like the most elevated kind of culture, the kind of culture that could go into India and turn savage people into civilized people or whatever, like the kind of racist um, tone that that had. And so there were a series of books. I don't remember the author. They were very popular in um, in Britain in the early 20th century when kind of Golding was um, growing up, first becoming a writer where um, young British boys would get lost at sea or something, and they would use their incredible ingenuity to band together and help one another and save like um, poor and civilized people who couldn't, didn't have the, the cultural tools necessary to rescue themselves or whatever, right? And so they'd kind of be like these little heroes, like hardy boys for Britain type of a thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and he was satirizing that by taking some British kids and like exposing the sort of... Um, uh, the underbelly of British culture and the way that it formed um, the sort of moral side of, of human beings and using children as kind of to, sh to satirize the, the notion of um, British culture could even take young boys and already be molding them into like these future heroes or those ultimate examples of um, the paragon of human nature or whatever, right? Um, and so I think with that tinge on it, um, I think it's actually a good point to make that the difference between the kids in Lord of the Flies, who obviously aren't real, right? They're fictional, right? When you compare that kind of fictional example to this real life story of Lord of the Flies from these um, these kids from Tonga, I believe is the, the little island or nation that they're from, um, is that it's contingent what would happen in these situations. Hmm. There might be a situation where there are kids who are, are just human beings in general who are such that they would end up eating each other alive. And there are situations where people would band together in those situations. And we do have evidence um, sociologically, right, that in um, emergency situations, people tend to actually band together more so than go their own way, right? But then, of course, those emergency situations aren't necessarily ones where, um, like, you know, the kind of pandemics that you see in like a movie or whatever, like a zombie plague or something like that, right? So it's hard to say whether or not human nature is such that this would happen or that would happen, right? The real point is that it's kind of contingent, right? You have both mm -hmm. human nature, whatever that may or may not be, and then the sort of particularities of individual culture and the particularities of individual human beings within that culture and their ability to distance themselves from the sort of way that they've been enculturated. And with all that complexity comes no easy answer to the question about whether or not human beings are fundamentally altruistic or non-altruistic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think contingency really is the ultimate point that should be made here. And we shouldn't be sort of using this story um, that uh, from these kids from Tonga as a sort of way of debunking the sort of Lord of the Flies uh, lesson or example. Neither should debunk either, right? We should more take a lesson mm -hmm. from how the sort of radical contingency at the level of um, human beings, how they're enculturated, and all the com um, complexities and particulars that flow from that. And uh, that's not like a, you can't really make a movie out of that, <laughs> right? Hmm. Um, but I do think the whole dunking on the Lord of the Flies thing is, is not really the lesson that we should be taking from this example from the kids from Tonga. Instead, we should kind of celebrate the fact that these kids are awesome 
and their you know moral exemplars and uh the kind of things that even adults should aspire to because they're pretty cool Hmm. You know, it's interesting because we're going to talk about this as we move into the book more, but there's this real kind of idea that there is a real true nature of reality, right? Of human nature, that the human spirit either is this way or it is that way. And we need to unmask it and that supposedly that, you know, that Golding's Lord of the Flies unmasks the uh, positive constructions of the state or of bourgeois society and releases the true kind of reality of um, kind of violent nature or something like that. And then, of course, the Tongan one is that, oh, no, like, look, actually, true human nature is altruistic and, you know, kind of like has high ethical and moral principles and is um, ingenious and things like that. And that's truly what human nature is. But they both seem to presume this idea that there's like a mask that we need to reveal and take off so that we can get to the kernel of the really real that is standing behind everything. And if only we have the instruments or the insight or the perspective or the technology or the tools to somehow scrape beneath the mask, then we can reveal the truth. So, I mean, there's even like an ontological problem here as well, right? Yeah, I think the, the assumption of that sort of fundamental human nature behind however we're enculturated is obviously a problem, right? Yeah. Um, but I also think that, you know, the, the sort of the real perniciousness of this sort of fundamental human nature thing is it sort of backs up the notion that humans are just a certain way and there isn't a really strong sense in which they are sort of developed by their surroundings in an important sense. Yeah. And the idea that these sort of Tongan kids who, I guess the assumption is obviously not having a lot of, you know, historical background here, um, that they didn't grow up in like a strongly capitalistic consumeristic culture. And so that's right, why right. they're like naturally bent towards, uh, or maybe sort of not so naturally, but they've been developed in such a way they're bent towards um, altruism and towards cooperation and things like that. Right. Um, and there may be a lot of truth to that. And then maybe the fact that if you have these same kids and you place them in a world where, or in a culture where it's strongly individualistic and consumeristic and, and they don't have this sort of um, bent towards cooperation, they're maybe not sort of morally, psychologically developed in such a way to be able to do these things. Um, and we shouldn't sort of just assume based upon sort of ethnographic uh, superficialities one way or the other, right? But yeah. there's there's a strong sense in which those things are going to affect how people act. And just relying upon this fundamental human nature thing sort of obscures that fact. Yeah, totally. If you took a group of British schoolboys and you shipwrecked them like bourgeois, like upper class or whatever, let's say middle upper, upper class, whatever, schoolboys and shipwrecked them on an island or something, they wouldn't somehow just lose all of the years of enculturation that they've had, right? It's not like that somehow the truth of reality would break free and we'd really come to see what humans really are underneath all of that extra added layers and things like that. No, they would still be kind of living according to whatever it was, the principles that they have, the language that they understand, um, all of the years of conditioning and training and things like that. They would just kind of modify it to within these new conditions, right? Um, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't like radically transform. It doesn't mean that it would be a perfect like replication of previous life. But you can't somehow you can't somehow speak of it as though there are like these like separate domains, like there are layers, right? And that you can just peel off these layers. It's much more of an integrated or embedded relationship that we kind of need to understand when we're talking about these things as well. You know? Yeah, and I think a really important point there is intellectual development does not entail moral development. Hmm. And that was, I think, a big part of why I enjoyed Lord of the Flies in the beginning. And I think part of Golding's point was that, yeah, just because these kids will have all these sort of Boy Scout-like abilities to survive in the wild because they've, you know, grown up in this quote-unquote elevated culture does not mean that they're going to be morally developed in such a way that they're going to sacrifice for others and right. put themselves in danger for others. In fact, it may be the opposite. It may be that they have this class hierarchy um, at the center of their sort of moral thinking, um, sort of placed in them by British culture. And they're not really old enough yet to fully uh, judge it, right, from some abstract level. And so they're fully capable of cooperating and working for the greater good, but they won't do it because they're selfish. Um, yeah. And not because that's human nature, but because they've been kind of morally stunted by sort of the, um, the facts of the British Empire and how it sort of... Uh, and enculturates you towards these sort of racist tendencies and towards these individualistic and selfish tendencies. Yeah. There's a little bit of like a noble savage kind of rhetoric, it seems like, in this this Guardian article as well, right? 
this like romanticization, this fetishization of um, the true human spirit that exists outside of modernity. Like if only we could tap into um, quote unquote primitive understandings or these alternative non-modernist conceptions, Western conceptions of humanity, then we can find the salvation. So there's this, it's kind of like ontotheological, there's this salvific logic, and then it's almost this weird kind of like patronizing noble savage logic as well. So it almost seems like a quite highly problematic piece when, when I really start to think about it critically here. Yeah, and I mean, that noble savage rhetoric is not entirely wrong, right? There's something true about it, sort of criticism of modernity. But then when it sort of uncritically elevates um, some other culture in a way that it, it, it basically makes it seem like because it's not modern, therefore it's good that ends up sort of obscuring and ignoring and really giving credit to whatever it is that those kids and the way that they you know were enculturated helped make them the way that they are. Um, yeah. And so you don't really give credit to them. You end up giving credit to, or sort of just using it as a, um, as a way to sort of um, barrage modernity itself. Well, it becomes an abstract universal principle that neglects the particular. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's actually a very colonial logic because it actually is um, ignoring the particularity of the kind of decolonial perspective that it's feigning some sort of interest in highlighting. So it actually is kind of like a, a universal abstraction that places essence before existence, that places identity before the difference. And then it kind of like falls into the trap of what Deleuze would call a dogmatic and moral image of thought. And it kind of projects that imposition onto it. And I think here, this is going to be like a great transition into the text. Like we could say that it, it presumes a certain kind of universal totality or unitary conception of reality or the world, right? And, and when you do that, oftentimes you end up kind of exchanging the abstract, exchanging the, the universal and eidetic image in relation to the contingent, the material, the particular and you suppress the latter in favor of the former. That is a nice segue into the text. Oh shit! Segway! <laughs> All right, so should we just jump into this text? We give a nice little brief introduction, I think, uh, earlier. Yeah. I say, I, do you mind kind of leading this uh, discussion here? Yeah, sure. I figure we can just jump around. We both have okay. a number of notes and quotes I put together, so we'll see where it goes. We're usually pretty okay. open with these book clubs, letting the conversation flow where it's going to flow. Cool. We build, uh, what would you say? We build dams, not rivers. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? I don't know. Something like uh, we uh, we direct the conversation, but we don't tell it. We don't like build it from the ground up. Oh, yes. I like it. I like it. I'm going to be like... I surf the river. I don't build dams on the river. Can you surf on a river? Yeah, dude. How? If it's really if it's <laughs> if it's really fast and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I kayak the river, bro. <laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah, that works. Okay. So, reading the introduction and we thought, you know, it's going to take a lot longer for us to get through this book We're doing one chapter at a time, but we think that it probably fits the detailed and analytic nature of the book. And I think even reading the introduction, which is basically just Gabriel setting out uh, in bri like really briefly the various arguments he's going to address, is probably going to benefit us to do it this way because it seems like the book's going to be really, really um, clear, right? But very analytical. And the, you know, yeah, I, I, I do want to say for people that are curious either to read along or if you don't want to read along and you want to just listen, that's that's fine too. We're going to do our best to make it accessible for people who don't take the time or have the time to read it. I will say this. It's, there's a, it's like a paradoxical – my first impression is kind of paradoxical because it's on the one hand very clear and on the one hand very straightforward. And so in one sense, you would say, okay, does that mean it's accessible? And then at the same time, I want to say, but it's also extremely dense, right? But it's not, so far at least, abstruse. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's exactly what Gabriel's going for, too. He seems to okay. have taken on the, the ethic of clarity from analytic philosophy, um, but being willing to open up that methodological point to content that comes from 
German idealism. Yeah. Um, and from the continental schools and from Hegel and, and, and such. So um, and I, I really enjoy that because I would love to hear clear uh, explications of Hegelian and post-Hegelian thought, Fichte, Schelling, etc. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, how do we start this off? Do we just say just a tiny, tiny bit about who uh, Marcus Gabriel is? I mean, what is there to say other than that he's a, he's a rather young, I think he's only in his like 40s, or early 50s. Um, I, just, I, think, I think he's, I guess I, he's I, young for he's philosophy. Not, <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's, I don't think he's in his 50s yet. I've met the guy. He was like, uh, I met him at a conference in 2011, I want to say, in Scotland that we organized and he was the keynote. And, um, and at that time, I think he was like 35 or 38. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's definitely in his forties. And he's, he's, um, he did some work with Zizek earlier in his career. And so, and obviously he's, he's taken uh, upon himself the, the need to integrate, um, 20th century analytic philosophy, um, from, you know, the beginnings of like Frege and Russell, um, down to um, Kripke and Lewis and Putnam and a bunch of other figures from the you know 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s in analytic philosophy, and integrate them into uh, the concerns of um, you know Hegel and post-Hegelian continental philosophy. So he has a unique standing here, and being able to sort of I think he doesn't need to speak like 12 languages or something. Um, he, he he certainly sees himself as the person who's going to be bringing everybody together to sort of unite yeah. philosophy in a way. And he certainly won't achieve that. Um, but just in trying to do that, I think it's a, it's a pretty interesting way of thinking about your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as much as one can be as a philosopher, he's kind of a minor celebrity in Germany. He's on, you know, a lot of talk shows and he did a TED talk uh, about one of his other books about like why the world does not exist. I think it's called like why unicorns exist, but the world does not exist or something along those lines. Yeah, it's so actually you... like the best TED talk out there. <laughs> it's, it's a rather good <laughs> the, TED talk for the TED only talk. good TED talk. No, <laughs> for, yeah, whatever standard evaluation exists for what makes a good TED talk. He achieves yeah. it. Yeah, so and then he's famously kind of known for being the youngest full professor of uh, of philosophy in Germany, which is like a big deal because they've got a really rich philosophical tradition. And uh, and yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about him. And he um, he's also written some popular level books. You mentioned Why the World Does Not Exist, which if anyone's looking for a more um, accessible introduction to his work, it wouldn't. I would definitely behoove you to pick up Why the World Does Not Exist and maybe read that instead. I think um, a lot of the arguments that are going to be in this book are going to be longer, um, more technical versions of the kind of things he addresses in that book. Um, and then also he's he's written some on, uh, I think the book's called Why I'm Not My Brain, something like that. I'm hmm. um, talking, getting a bit into the um, neuroscience uh, consciousness debates. Um, hmm. And so like David Chalmers type stuff. And uh, I'm sure he'll address that too. He even mentions one point in the introduction here um, that he's sort of positioning himself against the sort of um, 20th century materialism um, uh, movement. Um, and that I think comes from his, his understanding of sort of subjective experience itself as being a real kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that there's a certain bias amongst materialists in the 20th century uh, about bifurcating sort of subjective experience from the quote unquote real world. So that'll mm. be a big theme throughout this book as well, I think. Mm. I mean, do you think that's maybe the best way to talk about this book? Where does he position himself in the debates, the philosophical debates? Yeah, part of it. I think he's going for something bigger than, than just here's a new position in the major debates today. I think there's a strong sense in which he's trying to integrate that idea of, you know, where do I exist on this, you know, realism versus anti-realism angle on various topics um, with a larger systematic understanding. Um, I do think he's trying to build a system, but maybe in a indirect way, if that makes sense, rather than just starting from first principles and building it from there, like in, you know, Cartesian style. Um, he's maybe trying to do a little bit of a piecemeal system build over time. Cause he just mm. trying to, he's trying to, you know, include in a, like a full on epistemology and a metaphysics and an ontology and a relation between the two. And I'm sure there's going to be some references here to like value theory and how that works as well. So there's some kind of a system in the background here. 
Which is really interesting because then that means that the methodology is actually kind of an expression of the very philosophical position that he's articulating. Because the argument from first principles tends to argue from what he would call the old metaphysical position, right? Mm -hmm. The ultimate ground of the nature of reality. Whereas just a purely like perspectival one is where you're just playing with texts. You know, the cliche is like a Derridian sort of playing with texts, perspectives, uh, you, you, relativism kind of thing um, whereas his whole thing is kind of like starting in media res you have to engage both with both with perspective but also speculatively engaging with these larger what we might call metaphysical or ontological concerns so it's kind of almost as though like the very methodology that he employs in this text fits perfectly as an expression of his actual philosophical goal yeah there's that classic notion of rebuilding the raft while you're on the water right mm. you have to use what you are you have to use what you're um you have to use the boat itself to rebuild it or something like that, right? Uh, more yeah. eloquent way of putting it, however you could do it. Um, and so he even says at the end of the introduction that his his point is not here to have the last word, right? So many system builders are trying to sort of have the last word, right? By doing like a Spinozistic a geometric deduction of, of mm -hmm. principles, right? Um, and he's not trying to have a last word. He's trying to be a point in the dialectic, right? And uh, so there's a kind of epistemic humility there, which is, I think, important too. You can still do system building and have that important level of epistemic humility. You don't have to choose between being a full particularist or being Spinoza, right? Mm, right, right, right. Okay, cool. So um, I guess maybe we start with uh, his distinction between ontology and metaphysics, or I guess his addressing the distinction between ontology and metaphysics. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, sure. You got, you got a quote to deal with? Well, I mean, at the very beginning of the introduction here, and I'll just kind of bounce around to a couple different quotes and kind of try to stitch them together. The very first lines of the book are, <clears throat> According to common wisdom, ontology concerns what there is, or rather, what there really is. In one breath, it is often supposed to be concerned with the problem of how reality is, regardless of our preconceived opinions. And then he starts talking about how ontology and metaphysics have regularly been identified. And he says, in the current literature, they are often used interchangeably as names for the investigation into the fundamental nature of reality, where reality seems to contrast with appearance. And then he says, what is more, reality is treated as a unified domain that goes by the common name of the world. That's probably a good place to start. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's kind of two, it seems to me there's two basic arguments he's going to develop against this distinction between reality and appearance as constituting uh, metaphysics. Um, and that well, the first is that it sort of, by, by engaging in that bifurcation, it de like relegates appearance to non-reality, right? right? And he wants to have an account, um, a metaphysical account where appearance is part of reality because it is subjective experience is a real thing. Um, whether or not it accurately represents the thing it's supposed to represent, it's still a real thing. And so yes. an, a, 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 an account of ultimate reality has to include that somehow, right? Yes. And this, and this is a very, this is like, I think the really Hegelian point. Yeah, right? exactly. And this is something that is, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm constantly, obviously I'm, I'm engaging much more with this text in terms of my current projects in like the critique of political economy. So I'm constantly think I love how he actually delves into very briefly like psychoanalysis and critical theory here because um, this really is helping me think how I could maybe even position his argument to buttress some of the stuff I'm working through. And so I'm thinking here of this. So often in particular in readings of Marx, right, it's that, that, um, that there is a really real understanding of the value form or the commodity form, but um, that it appears in ways that uh, are mystifying, right? That commodity fetishism is some kind of like false consciousness or false thought or something like that. Well, we can kind of engage with it because that actually has a technical term for Gabriel later. But, um, but the point is, is that so many people, there are kind of positivist readings of this, this Marxist investigation into the commodity form. And what they tend to do is they tend to think like that appearance means like uh, a non-real engagement or encounter with the thing. Whereas 
the much more Hegelian, and then I think the reading that Gabriel would put forward here, is that actually, no, no, that the appearance is real itself. Appearance means expression, right? Or articulation or something along those lines. It doesn't mean like when we say, well, it appears this way, but it's not really this way. Rather, no, no, it means that it's like a shining. And actually in the German word, there's like Erscheinung and, and all these different words that it's like a shining forth. And I think that's something that's really kind of interesting to think about as well, because that's always in the back of my mind as I'm as I'm reading this text. So, sorry. You know, I think that's perfectly in line with what also Gabriel says about psychoanalysis and critical theory, which is from this vantage point where you understand the realm of appearances as itself grounded in some ultimate reality, which reality itself is also grounded in, and the reality appearance you know, distinction. Um, if critical theory and psychoanalysis are kind of these ultimately critical projects, um, sort of following from this reality appearance distinction and the problems that, that follow from it, those projects themselves are going to be really ultimately offshoots of like maybe the enlightenment project for understanding and for critical reason, right? They're just like basically corrective projects in a certain sense, mm -hmm. um, rather than sort of alternatives to the critical project. And I think I've heard Gabriel like mention this exact point before. So I don't mm -hmm. think I'm reading in to a couple of short paragraphs here where he talks about these projects. Um, and I think that's, I have a, a really strong um, sympathy for that view of seeing sort of the masters of criticism from like Marx and Freud and, and Nietzsche and, you know, even like, you know, Foucault and others who follow from that tradition as really being more about correctors of reason than necessarily sort of the critics or like the um, sort of enemies or villains of mm. reason or something like that, right? Um, so there's, there, we shouldn't sort of see um, like the end of the Enlightenment project necessarily, but more like at a really really important correction and not just correction in the sense of like making a like dotting your I's and crossing your T's kind of a thing, but like a fundamental redirecting of that critical project because it was so off course from whatever its, you know, initial conditions, which were wrong, had set it off on. And so mm. that sort of orientation, I think, is the one Gabriel is taking here. And, and I have a, not maybe necessarily like full identification with that view, but I think I have some strong sympathy for, um, for it. Mm. I mean, the only thing I would add to that is Deleuze, in his monographs, he's engaging with Spinoza, with Kant, with Leibniz, right? Like, he's mm -hmm. trying to work through their projects. Um, he's extremely concerned. I mean, his whole project, he calls it a transcendental empiricism. So there's something extremely Kantian, but at the same time, he's trying to develop a metaphysics for the age of kind of like post-Heideggerian... Uh, overcoming of onto theology right um and then at the same time foucault writes an essay on enlightenment what is enlightenment where he's engaging with kant again so i i just want to say that i absolutely agree with you that um that those thinkers aren't somehow just purely mystic uh anti-intellectual or, or anti-rational but rather it's a sort of like um problematization of the very rational project itself yeah, exactly. I think anti-rational is the best way of, of, of sort of viewing that misguided understanding of the critical projects of psychoanalysis and critical theory and whatnot. They're, they're not yeah. anti-rational. They're sort of a, they're very much a corrective form of, of rationality. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Agreed, agreed. So that's the first um, kind of main argument that he's going to develop against this uh, view of metaphysics, right? That appearances themselves have to be grounded in some ultimate reality as well. And so metaphysics would have to account for that. Um, uh, the way that the way in which appearances are grounded in ultimate reality. The second one is this idea, which um, we've hinted at already, that the world itself is not a thing that can exist, um, does and cannot exist. And so he really briefly sets out um, the argument from the list as being a an encapsulation of, of the longer argument, which he'll give in a later chapter about why the world cannot exist. But the basic idea is, I think, um, if I remember correctly from the text, you can imagine a list of anything, like imagine a world where just three things exist, and that's it, right? To make it less complicated, X, Y, and Z. You could make a list of those things, X, Y, and Z, but then the list itself would be a thing that would have to be added to it, right? And so maybe that's I mean, this like, is this is Russell's uh, paradox, right? In what way? That there cannot be a world of all worlds that we kind of encountered in Prozorov's text. Okay, so like an in set theory that you're talking about. In set theory, yeah, there cannot be like what is it the the set of all sets. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of tangentially related in that way, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so if you have that list, it's another thing that exists in the world, right? But then there's another list of the three things and the list. But then there's another list now of the three things and the two lists. And so the whole point is that goes ad infinitum. Uh, and that's not necessarily a knockdown argument itself, but it's a really brief sort of picture or illustration of what that argument's going to be when he kind of lays it out in more detail. And the ultimate conclusion being um, there can be no account of all the things that exist in a way that they're all equally coextensive. So like one set of all coexistence or something like that, right? Mm. Um, there will then another be another set of things or another list of things um, that can be used to account for all the things that exist and that will go on forever. So um, he's going to he's going to argue that in some sense metaphysics is in the sort of old sense, the old metaphysics, the old realism um, is set up on this uh, appearance reality distinction, which does not work. And then also assumes the existence of a capital W world that it is like a set of all the things that exist. And that itself is um, uh, sort of an, a, a concept that cannot actually be articulated. And so based on those two arguments, he's going to reject this old um, version of metaphysics. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, he says right here that basically this is kind of the, there are two primary ideas of the book. The first is the association of ontology and metaphysics. And then the second is the idea that there is or ought to be a unified totality of what there is. I really like this, that that there is or that there ought to be a unified totality, which to me, whenever I see ought, I think about ethics, right? And he's really concerned, I think, with maybe some of the implications that come from thinking from a unified perspective of the world. No? Yeah, at the very least, if not ethics, then value theory as a sort of bridge between metaphysics and ethics. Mm. So yeah, there's going to be some hints here, I think, towards towards that idea. And certainly in his other writings and in his various lectures and stuff, I think Gabriel sees um, some unfortunate moves in value theory as originating in bad metaphysics, which is a theme that we talk about a lot in the podcast as well, right? Any mm. mistaken in value theory is probably going to have some mistaken metaphysics behind it somewhere. Mm. Yeah, so uh, on kind of earlier... It, then then the actual where he lays out the list argument it's on page four he talks about um some interpretations over the word cosmos right and then he talks about like the greek use of the word cosmos and i love i love this because i think about this quite often but he says um so cosmos in the greek usually implies order so it doesn't refer to the whole material universe but rather to a certain conception of order and so one of the things that I think is so interesting in this is that um, I tend to think about the word cosmos in the Greek sense as being sort of almost salvific or redemptive, that it is a type of uh, performative that is seeking to reconcile, if you will, the, different, the differences or the discrepancies of the world. And I think you see this as one of the key concerns of uh, the forms, right, is that the forms uh, in, in Plato, Socrates are really eminently concerned with sort of unifying, if you will, differentiation. What is it that holds the universe together? What is it that holds cosmos together? And it starts from a sort of like concern, almost an anxiety over um, radical pluralism and radical difference and change and, um, and shifting in the world. And they get unified in this conception of uh, this, this concern in this conception of order and this idea of cosmos. So it almost has like a salvific tendency um, in its kind of performative deploy in, in philosophy. And I think it tends to work really in two ways. One that's kind of more conservative, that, you know, there was a cosmos, there was an order that we need to reclaim. And then there's more of like a progressive um, kind of future-oriented understanding of this like salvific reconciliation of difference into order uh, or cosmos or peace or something um, and that's the idea that it's always future oriented but it ultimately derives from a similar conception of thinking from totality of thinking about nature uh, i'm sorry thinking about the nature of reality as being sort of singular and unitary and i think that's kind of something interesting to think about as well yeah i think right in line with what you're saying here is um a point where Gabriel says, even granted that we can make reasonable metaphysical sense of the almost maximally unclear term, the cosmos, which I regard as the expression of our oceanic feeling of unity with an alleged Ooh. whole. 
Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what you're talking about, I think. This still leaves it open to think of the cosmos as only one domain among many, which would mm. come close to the view defended in this book. So I think that um, oceanic feeling of unity with an alleged whole, that's for sure that platonic anxiety um, mm. ab about differentiation, right? Or about difference. Uh, and, and I'm really intrigued to see how, because that's clearly like a, that's a subjective feeling, right? And so it's a, it's one that we naturally value. Unity with an alleged whole, right? That's something that human beings tend to strive after, especially on like a romanticist tinge to it. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see how we think, how he does like a critical move on that idea of the cosmos. It's not just wrong-headed, you know, um, logically speaking, but also as, as being bent towards some um, subjective preference that we have for, for unity um, and for feeling one with a whole whether that's going to play a role here at all or maybe mm. it's just an aside i don't know mm. uh, yeah no no they uh, that do you think that there is something and i'm sure he's going to engage with this when he talks about his term zoo ontology which i've I'm, i have no idea what the fuck it means really <laughs> um but i feel like do you think there's almost something in which we are maybe not hardwired but let's say softwired to need uh safety and we we are thrown into situations of precarity and anxiety because of maybe scarce scarce material resources or fear of flood or um fear of the enemy coming in and taking our resources or whatever i mean these are more kind of like primal ideas but i think they still persist maybe in just different uh expressions or articulations right but that the, that because we're in a world of fear and anxiety that we tend to and, and maybe this is a way that we could even think about some of the bases of how it is that reflective consciousness operates, but we tend to need to uh, reconcile that fear or to overcome those anxieties through fabrications of images, that is totalities, right? Those totalities that alleviate the anxieties of the fracturing, which images can alleviate through an imposition of totality. And so they become kind of performatives that, that alleviate that, that psychological anxiety, that social anxiety, right? Um, so it almost seems that there's something like in, in our wiring that that kind of tends us in that direction. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's certainly uh, like the negative maybe perspective on it, or sort of the critical um, explication right. of why we tend towards that. There's also a positive one I think, which is something along a Kantian line, like a Kantian um, like rational psychology line, where you talk about the fact that rational beings tend to want to think about and reason at the highest level they're capable of. And there's this bent towards thinking that wholeness or unity is that highest level, right? But it might be that we're wrong. <laughs> and it might be that there's like, there is some sense of unity or wholeness, right? But then there's a higher level that sort of usurps that because unity and wholeness does not actually end up being logically coherent mm. in the end. Um, and so I think, I think even Hegel said at one point that uh, sort of like his criticism of, um, of, I don't know, like Hinduism or like Indian philosophy or whatever he called it at the time. I'm sure there was racist tinges to it. Um, was something about how like wholeness um, is a really important point of philosophy, but it's the first important point. It's something like that. Um, so like that's kind of like the beginning stages of thinking about unity and wholeness. And then you have to think about, you know, difference and then eventually, um, you know, off Hebung from that. And mm. so there's there's something in both the Kant and Hegel lines is like the positive sense in which it's good that we like to think about wholeness and have this feeling of, of, of thinking of ourselves as, as one part of a whole, right? Um, that's integrated fully. But then that's like a step into, into eventually realizing, oh, actually, that's not true. <laughs> that, mm. that, that view is actually not logically coherent. We can't make sense of it uh, for various reasons. Maybe these two arguments we're talking about from Gabriel, two, two of those reasons. And so we then have to think about something like ultimate difference, whether that comes in like the Delusian perspective where difference comes before identity, or I think Gabriel's version is going to be kind of in between the two, where it's not really like platonic wholeness, right? Full integration of difference and identity. But I don't think it's also going to be like a, a switching of the two where difference has logical priority to identity. I think in some sense, Gabriel's going to have some middle ground between the two, however that works out in the end. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So just to kind of like recap here. So he is... Um, critical of what we might call like a, a, a common sense realism, um, which he associates with contemporary materialist, physicalist, um, eliminativist, scientistic discourses on the world that like ultimate 
reality is out there and we just need to unmask our illusory conceptions or perceptions so that we can get to the truth. There's something really interesting in this um, as a sort of critique of the, let's say, the dogmatism and the dominance of science, I think, that is going to be interesting. And real quick, oh, I just yeah, wanted to... Time. Yeah, and I just wanted to, to note something. I actually wrote this down, and I thought this was... I don't know how, how true this is, but it was just a thought that entered my mind. I want to see what you think real quick. Um, it almost seems that there is a type of anti-humanism, actually, in this realist perspective, right? At least the way that Gabriel is laying it out here, because um, basically it presumes a type of lack in human cognition or in human consciousness. It presumes a type of distortion and science is supposedly this discourse that doesn't fluff around with all of that perceptual mumbo jumbo because that stuff is illusory but science is the discourse by using mathematics by using particular tools of quantification by using certain technologies that is able to cut through all of that nonsense and unmask reality because it critiques the presumed falsehood of certain orientations in into the world so it's almost like in a way this cold brute scientism kind of has a type of anti-humanism and then it made me think then okay so then the the corrective on the other side of that is like an anti-realism right and an anti-realism almost has like an overwhelming fetishization of human constructions right it romanticizes everything that humans imagine and create and how they orient orient themselves in the world to the exclusion of the kind of cold scientific metaphysics right and so it kind of seems that one of them is this cold anti-humanist and one is more of like a kind of like warm uh pro-humanist kind of thing and i'm starting to think then now from a kind of a political and ethical perspective and one of the things that like historical materialism is oftentimes um uh described as as being extremely humanist because it's primarily concerned with the contingency of the world because we can change the world the world changes because there is this embeddedness and this integrative relationship between subject and object rather than kind of separating them radically as these two other positions do yeah yeah and i think an important point to make here and i think you're right that he's going to try and navigate sort of the and i think middle ground that i keep using here is incorrect there's going to be a different metaphor non-spatial one because i don't think he's actually trying to take like the best of both worlds or something like that uh, but in some sense trying to move beyond this distinction as the ultimate one between realism and anti-realism mm. um and i think it's important to note that when he uses this term science or sci scientific metaphysics or whatever we're going to call it just plug in there not science in general as it's practiced by all the different scientists in the world but instead a very narrow version of it that's practiced basically only by a, a few like a, a relatively small number of physicists right um so this is the view that physics tells us like currently our currently like developed physics as of right now in the 21st century is an account of all of reality well, think, of sheldon, think of sheldon think of sheldon from big bang theory right <laughs> Yeah, sure. He certainly would be an exponent of this, right? Um, <laughs> currently existing physics tells us everything that exists in the world, right? Or at least it will eventually um, tell us everything that exists in the world. And everything else is reducible and, and fully explained by um, currently existing physics. And Galen Strawson calls this physics collism <laughs> as opposed to physicalism. It's an even stronger version of physicalism. It's physics collism, mm. um, which is a mouthful, but it's funny. And... Uh, and it's important to note that because most scientists don't, at least they don't like, at least in practice, they do not subscribe to this view. Whenever a psychologist talks about beliefs as being a thing, right, that has causal efficacy in the world, then they're not subscribing to this view. They're they're thinking of a belief as a real thing that exists that's not um, reducible to like a set of particles in motion or, or you know fields and all the other junk that's in physics today, right. Whenever a geologist talks about a river as a real thing and the laws of how rivers move and change, um, they're in some sense, you know, rejecting this view. So when he when he says science, he does not mean all existing scientific practice, but instead this narrow band of ideology that exists amongst some physicists and wannabe physicists. But don't you think that it's actually not that narrow? Like, I tend to think, you know, like fucking Neil deGrasse Tyson, I keep getting these advertisements for his master class that he's going to do on teaching people how to think and remember he was the huge exponent of rationalia 
a world that was just simply, and how you had all of these fucking scientists and philosophers and all these people that were signing up, and weren't they like making merchandise? Remember, you did a shitty minute about this like two years ago or some shit. I like did, that. yeah. <laughs> um, so you got you got that, and then you've got even if the 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 I, my interpretation of this, I think he calls it scientistic at one point, and I and I really like that rather than scientific. Um, because what he's trying to articulate is that you mentioned it as being like sort of like ideological assumption, but it is this certain like metaphysical assumption of the world that science can and will reveal all the truth because it is the discourse that gives us access to the ultimate nature of reality. So in psychology, uh, evolutionary psychology, for example, I mean, even take somebody like Jordan Peterson, if he's going to appeal to some sort of like bullshit hierarchy that he observes in lobsters and then be like, oh, but this is just primal. Of course, human beings are sexually attracted to people because of blah, 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 because of evolution or something like that. He again is appealing maybe unconsciously to some sort of metaphysical assumption that there is a particular discourse that can scrape beneath all of the illusions that can get us to the true nature of human reality because it's based on evolution or based on some sort of like uh, exchanging of properties. So it's not just physics as the discourse, but I think you also run into this in other scientific disciplines as well insofar as they articulate that scientific, metaphysical, ideological assumption. Well, I think we, what you're talking about here is basically just the methodological bent towards reduction. And that any time reduction can be done, explanatory reduction, I and mean, even ontological reduction in this case, um, then we should do it. If it can be done, if we can even possibly yeah. conceive of it, we yeah, should yeah. do it. And that's a methodological point that I think is sort of ubiquitous. That's the point that even psychologists in the like evolutionary psychology realm, even um, you know biologists, even whatever, are sort of prone to because of that. Really comes down to like empiricism, I think ultimately. Um, and so that is, I think, a, like a plague that exists like everywhere in intellectual thought, yeah, everywhere, and, 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 in, and in science generally. But the specific version of that, I think, is most pernicious is the kind of physics closed version, which is that, yeah, okay. the like, like the it's like the monsterized version of it, right? Which is that no, not just reduction of whatever, but reduction of everything to like one fundamental thing, right? Okay, and it's the only yeah. real thing. So yeah, I think those are those are connected, right? One is more ubiquitous than the other. Like the, yeah, the yeah. small r reduction is more ubiquitous, and I think it's pernicious too. But like it's it's really monsterized version, right? Is the um, the like physics reduction where everything is reducible to um, physical entities, and that nothing else is really real in that sense. Now, does this tie into when he's talking about like myriological composition? Yeah, he mentions that, but I don't remember the context. So here's, here's what he says. He says, The tendency to look for reality on this side of the illusion also explains the ongoing debate about myriological composition. That is, the debate about the question of whether reality in itself consists of any possible composition of chunks of matter, including temporal parts of four-dimensional objects. Here, the idea is if reality is fundamentally physical reality, and if the latter is four-dimensional space-time, then there seems to be a sense in which my table right now is only a temporal part of my overall table, which would be a four-dimensional object stretching through time in the same sense in which it is extended in space. And then there's this great little quote. He says, as a lover says in a recent novel by Ferdinand von Schirach, you are never entirely there. There is always only a part of you, but another part of you is not there. And then he goes on after this to talk about uh, Graham Harmon using Heidegger's insistence that we must not ontologically undermine the thing. That is, the real things presented to us in meaningful interaction with the world. And what Harmon means by undermining is a type of reduction, right? A limit, an eliminativist reduction. Harmon wants to preserve the integrity of the thing or the object. However, Harmon also says there's another trap as well where you can overmine the thing, which he calls a mesoscopic view of things, which is by grounding them top down in an overall general eidetic structure. So again, one would be a sort of like radical nominalism where it's just all about the particulars breaking down into the reduction. And one is a sort of like radical universalism, a platonic idealism or something along those lines. Yeah, it does make me curious as to like what role maybe like Aristotelianism is going to play in this whole thing, because that seems like the classic example of trying to mediate between uh, radical nominalism and like a radical reduction to unity or something like that. And so um, maybe he's playing a similar role there and seeing maybe like the different levels of, of unity existing. Um, but that are in some sense maybe competitive or maybe not competitive, but themselves particulars. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how it's going to work, but yeah, there's some sense in which, and he calls the book fields of sense to, and it's plural for a reason. There's fields, not just one field of sense. Yeah. Uh, real quick, do we want to talk about why it's fields of sense? Like, what does he mean by sense? And then maybe by fields, and maybe that's where we can kind of like end this because that's kind of important, you think, yeah? Yeah, do you have the quote? I also wanted to talk about this meta-metaphysical okay, yeah. thing because that's going to be important too. Okay, yeah, that's that's probably important. Um, Hold on, give me one second and then um, the fields of sense one or... um. I have the meta metaphysical nihilism part. So let's do yeah. that first, and then we'll jump okay, do to that the one. field to sense okay. thing. So here's the quote of um, kind of, it's like a thesis statement of sorts. Um, I defend meta metaphysical nihilism. That is the view that metaphysics literally talks about nothing, that there is no object or domain it refers to. I will also call this the no world view. That is mm. the view that the world does not exist. Of course, I do not mean that nothing exists, which would be metaphysical nihilism. And a little bit later, he says, uh, I do not believe that existence is relevantly tied to quantification at all. I reject the idea that the meaning of existence can be fully or relevantly captured by the language of quantification. I also reject the idea that existence is relevantly bound up with the concepts we use in order to understand or practice set theory. So he's distancing himself from a, a practice and analytic philosophy of talking about reducing existence to um, the, existential uh, the existential quantifier, like there, there's a thing that exists that is such. Um, we'll, we'll get into that and probably talk a little bit about that when we get to whatever relevant chapters in the book. But this idea of meta metaphysical nihilism, um, is, um, he distinguishes there, and I think it's important to note, from metaphysical nihilism, which is the view that nothing exists, or some sense in which they're, um, I'm not sure if he's using this term in like the sense that they use it in Mariology, which would be metaphysical nihilism would be something that, I guess, like Mariological nihilism, the sense that there are no holes, there are only particulars, right? Hmm. And I guess my, maybe an even more radical version of that is there are no particulars. There's just nothing. Um, and he rejects both of those, it seems like, right? Hmm. There are only particulars or there's nothing, right? He's kind of rejecting hmm. both of those views, it seems like, to me. And he's going to instead say his view is meta-metaphysical nihilism. So you have the meta addended on to uh, metaphysical, uh, which I guess means in some sense um, there is no sort of ultimate object of metaphysical discourse, but there are things. Mm. And so, so how that's going to work out, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And and so what would be metaphysical nihilism? Well, he says here it's the view that nothing exists. Okay. So I'm taking that as in some sense maybe like a there's only appearance and there's nothing that appearance represents or something like that. I guess maybe like a radical idealism of a sort. But even that, I, th I would think that he wouldn't call that metaphysical nihilism because a p part of his argument here is that appearances are things. I mean, is this just simply? I mean, this is just simply when he says that there's no object or domain. So when metaphysics talks about whatever it tries to talk about, right, with its unrestricted quantification, he's saying, well, actually, there metaphysics is literally talking about nothing because there is no object or domain that it refers to. So this is basically just him maybe sort of slipping in the notion of. Um, uh, not infinite worlds because he doesn't like that. What does he call it? Where he talks about like maybe it's just the the, the plurality of fields, right? Um, yeah. Doesn't he doesn't he contrast his fields of sense with possible worlds? Yeah, he literally says he doesn't like the idea of possible worlds, and I don't have the exact quote here. Let me see. Uh, well, so I do have the bit on senses, but did you want to keep going about the meta metaphysical nihilism before we get there? Or no, I think this will be a good because his his. He's ambiguous there in that quote about what exactly his view is in between metaphysical realism and metaphysical nihilism. So going yeah. to the field of sense stuff will help, I think, clarify that. Cool. I'm also thinking about Prozorov here and Prozorov's use of both Heidegger and Badiou. And in particular, now I'm thinking about Badiou and the idea of the infinite worlds uh, thesis that Badiou articulates and that Prozorov uses by talking about how you can't have a set of all sets. And then Badiou obviously kind of articulates this this like infinite uh, proliferation of worlds that are interpenetrating and that, that kind of like are boundless and endless that are um, constituted within their own kind of like particular contingent ways through these like transcendental coordinates or indices and things like that, but that they could have been constructed otherwise, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that every world is constituted this way and they're also constantly always shifting and things like that. And I'm thinking if Gabriel isn't kind of doing something similar here by talking about his metaphysical nihilism is he's trying to open us up to this idea of like a plurality of worlds, except he doesn't want to use the idea of um, possible worlds because that is referring to like that sort of like David Lewisian type of, of metaphysics that he doesn't... Uh, 
uh, advocate, but more of like this post-Cantorian um, understanding of like a post-metaphysical metaphysics almost. That's kind of what I'm thinking he's getting at. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't mention Cantor that I remember, um, but I certainly no, see no. the connection yeah. with that and the way Bajou uses it and the way Prozorov uses it. So it'll be interesting to contrast those as we get as we get down to it, because I think he's going to have different sources, maybe. Okay. Um, um, he does are. quote Bedu a lot. I looked in the index. Oh, okay. So, yeah, That'll he be will interesting en- then, yeah. Yeah, he will engage Bedu a lot. So, okay, so real quick, here's the bit on senses. So um, on the page before, he's talking about epistemological pluralism. And he says, uh, in my view, epistemological pluralism is a liberal stance in that it allows for a plurality of forms of propositional knowledge that are not unified by any such thing as the method for finding out how things are and of justifying our findings in a privileged discursive practice in quote unquote science, he says, right? So he says, now while fleshing all of this out, he says, I'm going to replace some traditional vocabulary with a suitable ontological realist counterpart. So instead of perspectives, he's going to talk about senses. The relevant concept of of sense derives from a certain contentious reading of Frege. So in this reading, his reading, he says, first, senses are objective modes of presentation associated with objects. No matter what... Straight up Frege right there. Okay, no matter what kind of object is in question. So senses are objective rather than just perspectival okay right um and then second which they, and are, they is, are for frega and okay. sense of reference which we'll probably have to read <laughs> yeah yeah you're gonna have to yeah. you're gonna have to force me to read that probably um okay and then this is the contentious the contentious claim senses are properties of objects not ways of looking at them so senses then are not they're not um orientations or dispositions from a subject perspective but actually senses are properties of objects themselves. And I would say I think they are expressive properties. So they are expressions of uh, the objects themselves. And this is where you get the sort of idealist, the Hegelian idealism coming in. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I think that the first point he makes there, I'm not sure if he's if both these points are supposed to be the contentious points about Frege. Um, no, just the, just the second one. Yeah, because the first one's just classic. That's just straight up Frege. Like senses are objective things; they're not just um, subjective perspectives on things. Okay. Um, so, th- what's the second point again? That senses are properties of objects, not ways of looking at objects. Yeah, so I'm not sure what he means by properties of objects. That'll be curious to get to and see what he actually means and what's contentious about that. Because the first point, I don't think it's contentious at all, really, mm. um, about Frege. So, and on sense and reference is a classic text. I think you'll actually like it. As much as um, Frege gets cast as like the, the father of analytic philosophy or whatever, um, mm. his, he's, he's a much, he's a very uh, very clear writer, but I think engaging writer. And he certainly doesn't have the unfortunate tendencies of his forebears um, when it comes to like uh, everything is about reduction and stuff like that that we're talking about. He certainly mm. wasn't that way. Okay, so and He's taking a lot more from the German tradition and from Kant than uh, than I think the later analytic philosophers in the Anglo Anglo speaking world were. Okay, well I'll have to I'll have to brush up on my Frege then, since I know <laughs> like one thing about Frege. Um, okay, so real quick then to clarify what he talks about on the next page, he says, "My position is that objects are individuated." So he's still talking about this second content contentious point that senses are properties or features of objects he says my position is that objects are individuated by descriptions that objectively hold good of them regardless of whether anyone is apprehending the facts about the objects and then he says loosely speaking senses are part of the furniture of reality so they're actually part of the furniture of reality And he says, which is why reality can appear to us without thereby somehow being distorted. That star that looks like a tiny speck from here under our neurobiological earthbound standard conditions tells us something about how things really are and not just something about how they seem to us. Yeah, what I take from this, and tell me if you're you're tracking with me here, he has a pluralism at the level of both epistemology and it seems like ontology as well. Yes, but that pluralism is not grounded in our perspectives of things, which is the way that anti-realism tends to cast it. Right, 
anti-realism tends to cast it as the reason why pluralism is true at the ontological and then epistemological level, uh, or maybe it's, it's ontological because it's epistemological, because there's no real way of knowing things um, for sure. That's why we have to sort of admit this ontological pluralism. It could be anyway, right? Mm. Um, you can have like a Kantian version of that where you can't access the, the noumena or whatever, or a more radical version where you reject the noumena as just appearances. And that's why you have this pluralism. He's saying, no, 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 there is a reality, right? There is a reality out there independent of how anybody thinks about it, but it itself is pluralistic ontologically. It seems mm. like is what he's saying. And that grounds our epistemological pluralism, our ways of knowing things in these multiple ways, or these fields of senses. Um, well, I guess the fields of senses would actually be ontological, then not epistemological, uh, contrary to sort of the anti-realist tendency. So it seems like... Wait, he's, can he's we taking... say, does it ground our epistemological pluralism? Because doesn't that give priority to a supposed object and then kind of like just perpetuate an object-object sub subject -object distinction? I, I have think... no idea how he's going to do that. I'm just assuming like a classic version of where... Uh, epistemology is grounded in ontology, but he may not, he may reject that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So here's an interesting thing. I looked in the index and there's no engagement with Deleuze at all, um, at least from the index. He does engage Manuel Delanda, who is a Deleuzian, and in particular, a, a book on um, like the like intensive science, I think it's called, which is really going to be important. And here's the reason why I'm curious if he engages with Deleuze. Deleuze does something I think kind of similar, for, at least from what I'm kind of just barely starting to gather from this introduction here, which is that when he talks about an object, um, let's say I'm looking at my coffee mug in front of me right now, that he's kind of doing a, a, his own like inversion or a transformation of Leibniz's monadology, that there's a sense in which like totality of substance is refracted or reflected or inheres within this cup, but this cup is just a particular uh, expression of that totality, right? It's a particular expression in, in Spinozist terms. It's um, a, a mode, let's say, of substance, right? But nevertheless, um, it's still a full articulation and a true articulation of substance. And so I'm wondering if there's something similar going on here, right? So that the senses of the object, let's say the sense of this coffee mug and the various ways that I can look at it, those are all expressions of um, the substance that is expressed and articulated only in these particular individuated ways that is this particular coffee mug at this particular time in these particular conditions um, but that nevertheless that doesn't mean that it's just purely something that I'm projecting onto it because of my consciousness and neither does it mean that I'm just simply like corresponding my thoughts to some pre-existent reality but that rather uh, that there's some sort of like intuitive connection between my consciousness of this particular set of expressions and the object that is expressed to me you know yeah i do think at the level of where this this pluralism is ontological um is something he's gonna maybe have in common with that kind of delusion reading you're talking about i do wonder if he's gonna sort of reject that view ultimately for reasons that like baju and zizek do because they see it as sort of a a capital s substance as being a form of like this um ultimate reduction to unity mm. and i know that you probably have qualms with that reading of Deleuze. Um, so we can, that'll be a good theme for us to like fall back on and see whether or not his reading of Deleuze follows that uh, Zizekian, Bajouian line, which I think a lot of people reject as a superficial reading of Deleuze. Interesting. Yeah, I'm really curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, and then real quick, the, real quick, the last thing I just wanted to say about senses is this is where he talks about, um, instead of talking about domains of objects, he says, I'll talk about fields of sense where a field is supposed to lay out structures for objects to appear within independent... Um, to, uh, let me start that over. Uh, a field is supposed to lay out structures for objects to appear within independent of our projections of criteria of identity. So yeah, that's why he's going to talk about fields of sense. Yeah, which would be interesting to see how he fleshes out that notion of field and why he chooses it, which is a scientific term, generally speaking, right? Mm. Um, unless I'm, I'm unaware of the etymology that pretty existed, it's scientific usage in that way. Um, you know, I, I figured you would like this term anarchical realism that I loved it develops at the end here. I fucking yeah. highlighted it and I started. And... <laughs> I like it. And he says, um, 
he differentiates the these two views as being or this um, his view from this other view as all chains must stop somewhere which he thinks is true i think he means like explanatory and ontological chains of things right um and he contrasts that with there is somewhere where all chains must stop and that's the old realism where there's some unity where all things are are reduced to and he basically he and he even says that's onto theology yeah that all things stop in some ultimate fundamental unity. And that's the view he's rejecting because that's the, you know, capital W worldview and he's holding mm. this no worldview, right? No worldview. Um, but instead, but the, still the view that all change must stop somewhere, he thinks is true. There's a realism, but it's not a, it's not a realism that's sort of um, folded in like a great chain of being style um, of realism. So mm. it seems to me like he's, he's still keeping the realism from the old metaphysics, right? But he's mm. introducing the pluralism from the anti-realism side while rejecting the idea that that pluralism on the anti-realist side is sort of grounded in our own subjectivity or our own subjective perspectives. So mm. there is like a, a Hegelian off bunk happening here between realism and anti-realism, it feels like to me. Mm. Yeah, 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 totally, 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 totally. And it, just to kind of spoil a little bit about how this is going to end up introducing areas of aesthetics and value theory and axiology and stuff like this. He says uh, at the end of the chapter here that as long as we think that there are two competing ways of explaining the world, that of science and that of religion, there will always be a struggle between the two, which is both a misguided philosophy of science and even more so of religion. I am not making a relativist point of equal validity here. Again, not the anti-realist side, well, it's just a bunch of subjective perspectives and that's all. I am saying that neither science nor religion can amount to world pictures. If they were essentially tied to the possibility of world pictures, which I do not believe, we would have to consider them as erroneous and replace them with different practices. So he does want to like integrate areas of um, science and religion and sort of remove this competition that they're supposed to have by being different capital W world pictures, he says. The chains or the, the place where the chains must stop either in science or in religion. Yeah, the non-overlapping magisteria kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that theme is yeah. going to be there as well, I think. And that'll be really interesting to think about, I think. Mm. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, I really do enjoy, at the end, his, let's say, uh, his own reproduction of the overcoming of onto theology. And he says that this is so important for us. And he talks about how because both Heidegger and then he says in his wake, Hans Bloomberg were right in pointing out that onto theology still shapes our current world pictures in virtue of the fact that they are world pictures. And I thought that this was so interesting because this is one of the things that, that I find so important about Sartre's work, his critique of um, essence preceding existence in his formulation of existence preceding essence, particularly I think in the formulation that he outlines in Critique of Dialectical Reason, which is an extension of his earlier existentialist formulation of existence preceding essence. But it's the idea that the idea, um, when that oftentimes precedes the particular, then what ends up happening is that leads to certain political and ethical uh, issues. And then Deleuze also critiques um, the entire philosophical tradition, which he really ultimately faults, I think, really with Aristotle, as giving priority to identity over difference. And whenever you think of uh, uh, from the perspective of identity, what ends up happening is that it leads to what he calls a dogmatic and moral image of thought. And I think you get something similar here, too in what Gabriel is going to be articulating that he just kind of like talks about it with regards to a critique of onto theology when I think the critique of onto the uh, onto theology does something similar and so I think that's what's going to be really interesting to think is that there is a sort of like political you calling it value theory we might call it an ethical or social set of implications that can come from this project and I think in very kind of like interesting and creative ways and that's what I'm kind of curious to to see if I can apply to when I'm when I'm working through this text yeah, I'm I'm really anticipating that, and I think it's this is, gives evidence to the fact that this book is not just about ontology, right? It's a it's a right. it's addressing an entire system of things and how metaphysics and ontology relates to political theory, social theory, value theory, um, and everything else interweaves together, even epistemology. So, um, cool. yeah, it's it's addressing all of philosophy at once, which is the best oh. kind. Amaze balls, man. I'm really <laughs> excited for this. I actually woke up this morning and I was so excited to, to, to like read over this chapter and think about it. And I was kind of really tired. And then I read the chapter and I actually got like super invigorated after reading it. So I'm really excited to go through this with you. 
Yeah, I'm really excited too. Um, I really miss these. These are my favorite parts of the podcast. Doing these together, I think I get so much out of um, hearing your perspective on this text. Uh, it's basically like a, a really small seminar that we do. And totally. uh, we all got into this thing because we love that kind of discussion. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, man. Okay, well, cool. So I guess we're going to take um, a slow journey through this text. So bear with us out there. If you have questions, please, you can email us along the way, tweet at us, whatever. But uh, yeah, if you have any suggestions on readings or anything like that, especially if they're really short that we can get into as well, um, you know, feel free to, to share those as well. But yeah, join in the reading club with us, y'all. Yeah, we're going to try to maybe take some breaks and read a thing by Frege, Kripke, <coughs> Lewis, um, wh whomever comes up as a dialogue partner for uh, Gabriel here. So if you have any suggestions about that, or if you're saying, hey, you know, you've been talking about this um, notion and I'm not familiar with it, would you mind diving into it more? We'll be happy to do that as well. Cool. All right, so let's move on to our next segment, which is the Sticky Leaves. This is the segment of the podcast where one of us talks about whatever it is that's granting us meaning in a potentially meaningless universe, maybe devoid of fields of sense. So we're, you know, pretending mm -hmm. it's not true for right now. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the uh, senses that are giving you meaning? All right. So for anybody who has known me for an extended period of time or spent a considerable of time with me, even in short bursts, would know that I am not a morning person. I'm just not. Ever since I was a kid, I've been... A night owl. I used to stay up to play video games way past my bedtime. I would always wake up really tired for school. And then I would like sleep in class and shit because I wanted to stay up late. I don't know why. It was FOMO, I guess. And then of course I wasn't really doing anything productive. I was just fucking playing video games or watching Sports Center or whatever it was that I was doing. You know what I used to watch too? Do you remember when Beanie Babies were a thing? There was this fucking there was this guy that used to sell, like, on QVC or some shit like that. He used to sell, like, rare baseball cards and Beanie Babies. I used to watch this guy all the time, like, like I was a collector or something. Like, I wasn't some serious collector. I was, like, 10 years old or something. But it was, like, when Beanie Babies were a thing, and he would go off about, like, how rare this Beanie Baby selection is or whatever. I'd stay up to, like, fucking 2 in the morning and watch this guy just talk about all these different collector's items. It was Beanie Babies, and then the one thing I did actually collect were, like, baseball cards, basketball cards, and stuff like that. When the Mark McGuire Sammy Sosa baseball race to uh, beat Roger Merritt's his record was going on, he was on there every single night selling, like, Mark McGuire rookie cards and... <laughs> <laughs> all that kind of shit. And I actually have um, the like 80, I think it's 87 Donruss or whatever it is set of with Mark McGuire's rookie card in it. So that's not like the really expensive one. There's also like an 86 tops or something. I can't remember. It's something like this. I'm, I'm just pulling out numbers and names based on what I kind of vaguely remember. But I would stay up watching that shit. So it's not like I was even doing anything like super productive, but I've just always been a night owl. You know, that translated into high school, then it translated into post high school and university and like party time and then clubbing and shit like that. I've just never been like a morning guy. There are times when I have, you know, kind of an earlier routine. And by early, I mean like maybe I'll wake up between seven and eight, <laughs> but like, I'm not really an early dude. If I had like a nine to five or an eight to five job, I was the dude that would like sleep until the very last second and then <laughs> like rush my ass there just because I hate getting out of bed. But, but I am now really, really starting to love watching the sunset. Now, sunrise, you mean? That's what I mean. I'm sorry. Sunrise. Thank you for the correction. Uh, I always love watching the sunset. I am starting to love watching the sunrise. Over the past few days, I've been waking up at 6.15 every single morning and making myself a cup of peppermint tea and sitting on my balcony and watching the freaking sunrise. And today it didn't happen so much because it was kind of cloudy and rainy and overcast. But um, watching the sunrise and waking up early has been so wonderful and it's gonna sound so cheesy because this is all the shit that like my mom has told me for years about why she wakes up before the sun rises my mom wakes up at like 4 30 in the morning every morning just because she's crazy but she likes to wake up 
and listen to the birds and go hiking when the world is still still and calm. And she likes to wake up her day with like the earth as it's waking up. And I kind of always like, yeah, 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 that sounds really great. Like in my like weird romantic alternative universe where I actually have the willpower to do that sort of thing. And in this world, I just was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, man. I'm, I'm sleeping. I'm going to stay up late and I'm going to watch fucking reruns of the same thing that I've watched a thousand times, right? <laughs> um, but I fucking – I'm really loving the sunrise, man. I'm really loving being up early. Um, it's going to be weird. I mean it's really convenient right now because of the lockdown. There are no bars that are open, so I don't have any temptation to go out and stay late and party or anything like that. So it's going to be really weird when things reopen again if I'm just going to have to like say no because I know as soon as I have one of those 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. casino nights – that's going to fuck up my sleeping pattern, and there's no way, obviously, I'm going to wake up early, and then I'm going to sleep late, and then I'm not going to be able to go to bed early the next night, and then it's going to fuck me all up. So I'm wondering how long I can sustain this, but I'm really going to try to make this like a thing. I'm going to try to make this a thing and see if I can become a morning dude because I fucking love it. So, like, why would I not do it? It's, it's just like about habit and willpower, but, like, I really, really, really do enjoy it, so I'm going to just keep fucking doing it. Um... And yeah, and it's for all the same reasons. I commune with the birds. The rainbow lorikeets start freaking out at around between 6 and 6.30 because I can actually hear them now that I'm wake when I'm waking up at like right before 6.15 or between 6 and 6.15. I can actually hear them. And then when my alarm goes off at 6.15, I, I can still hear them pretty loud up till I'm sitting on my, on my balcony and they're kind of going crazy. And I don't know. There's just something about waking up with the earth that's kind of nice. Even though I know that's a sort of like perspectival kind of a folk position because I'm not actually waking up with the earth but from the setting in which I find myself what did uh, Gabriel call it from this like neurobiological earthbound perspective or whatever <laughs> like I'm really enjoying waking up with life it's it's been really wonderful so yeah I I'm enjoying the sunrise I would recommend people give it a shot Enjoy that sunrise. Enjoy that cup of tea. Enjoy that cup of coffee. If you're already an early riser and you're like, yeah, motherfucker, I've been doing this for 20 years. I go for like long runs and shit like that. Or I wake up and I do poetry or I meditate or I do yoga or whatever. Message me and let me know about your experiences of being an early riser. And if you're not an early riser, give it a shot and let me know what you think because I fucking am really enjoying it. Here's the thing though, dude. You know that being a night owl and being an uh, morning person are mutually exclusive, right? Like once the lockdown ends and you can be back to partying and shit like that, you're gonna have to choose. I know, I know, I know, I know. I worry, <laughs> I, I worry. And my, like, you know how they say the force is strong with that one? Yeah, the force is weak with this one. I, I have no willpower, man. The pull to the dark side is just, <laughs> it's very tempting. Literal dark in that sense. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Not just morally. Uh, yeah, I mean, I totally get it, dude. Like, I'm not really... I guess I'm, I'm more of a morning person than, like, maybe the average person is, maybe. But I, I don't get up super early or anything. But I, I totally understand the um, the reason why to do it, right? I mean, there's something about... I love being... After you've woken up fully and you're out doing stuff, and there's, it's quiet, no one's out, and you kind of have the world to yourself. You know, I that's my preferred way of existence. So I love that. Um, I even have a buddy who he lives out in the in the in the forests out here in a cabin so it's basically mm. nobody around and he likes to get up with the sunrise and he says the way to do it and he's read that there's some like evolutionary psychology that that um like vacuously uh, backs this up that if you stand out in a star pose completely naked outside <laughs> during this like star pose means like your your legs and your arms fully extended right yeah um and totally naked and watch the sunrise facing it while you can still look at it before the sun gets so bright that you can't look at it anymore. Like do that. And he says that uh, evolutionary psychology says you will be a superhuman for the rest of the day. And like, <laughs> it's like you're sucking in the energy of the sun as you're fully extended, naked, taking it in every pore of your body. And then you just spend the rest of the day just as Superman using the energy <laughs> of the sun in the world. All right, two things. One... <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna try this tomorrow morning <laughs> on my balcony in front Can of you be everybody. Naked, though? Yeah, hundred percent, dude. Fuck it, whatever. <laughs> uh, and two, does this buddy of yours also sit on the ground and open up his butthole to the sun and get the sunning? What is that? What is that technique called? 
Oh, yeah. That was a big thing like six months ago, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is he down no, with that I shit? Think, I don't think he does that, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because remember like Josh Brolin burned his asshole or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I vaguely remember that. Oh, God. And there, I guess there was this like group of people that thought – I don't remember. They thought you could like harness like astrological power. I forget what they're called. There's like a, a name for them. Um, but they thought you could like – like basically breathe you could survive off of oh no that's like the breatharians no what am i but there was this like it's been around for a long time <laughs> where you can like literally like harness astrological power by opening up your asshole to the sun that's why everyone started doing it because they thought why it was would cool it be your asshole though there are other holes <laughs> but it's just going in bro it's just going you directly like in your, your skin is porous like it. i'm gonna stand there tomorrow morning totally naked and just open my mouth as wide as i can <laughs> Oh. <laughs> uh, oh Jesus! I'll I'm do excited ten, to hear about the results. Ten minutes on the front, opening my mouth, and ten minutes on the back, where I just like bend over my railing and just open up my <laughs> asshole. Uh, uh, well, here's we the thing: the explicit tag. Now we have it. <laughs> yeah, here's the thing, bro. Like, and then if someone tries to report me and they're like, "Ah, oh, indecent exposure," I can just be like, "This is part of my religious practice," you know? <laughs> Does that fly in Australia? No, you're right. You're right. Well, fine. It's for health <laughs> benefits. Whatever. Like, either way, you can't fucking come after me for breaking any sort of laws. You're on your private property. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If you're looking into my window, that's your business. <laughs> oh Jesus. So yeah, sunrise is amazing. I love it. Plus, I've been waking up in the morning and doing like a morning surf session. And so before I have any caffeine, I mean, sometimes I'll get like uh, like a cup, like a we call it an Americano in the States. They call it a long black here. And I'll just go and I'll just get a small one. You know, it's just got like a single shot of espresso in it um, just to give me a, a nice little kick, but nothing, nothing too crazy. Because really the water and the sunrise and everything is really enough to invigorate me. It's more of like a habit thing, like a comfort thing. But I love it, man. Um get out there and you know you're out there with other people and i don't i don't know that there's like a different person in the morning than there is at night i mean first of all they're sober so that's one thing but the different people are up in the morning and i like the people that are up in the morning they're good people they seem nice you know they kind of all they kind of all have the same vibe they're all there to try to get that power of the sunrise and i dig it so you know what i bet you all the tonga kids were morning people no, ah, see, that's it. Yeah. That's it. That's the real crux of the argument right there. It has nothing to do with, like, <laughs> culture or anything like that. It's just purely about being in touch with, like, circadian rhythm and all that shit. So, yeah, we're going to rewrite that article. Yeah, you live in England and it's, you know, stormy and gray all the time. You never get to experience the sun. That's right. But if you're fucking Tongan, if you're from, like, a warm climate, a tropical climate, then, you know, you automatically are a better person. That's it. That's the answer. Cool. Wonderful. Glad we solved that. Done. All right. Let's go ahead and wrap up the episode right there. Yeah, dude? Yeah, yeah. Sweet. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you share. Make sure you tweet at us, owls underscore at underscore dawn. With any questions, you can email us, owls at dawnpodcast at gmail.com. Um, what else? I think. Is there anything else? Find us on Twitter at owls underscore at underscore Don, Insta, all the various social media platforms. We're there somewhere. You can find us. Maybe we'll respond. <laughs> Definitely on Twitter. We follow Definitely. that pretty well. Definitely on Twitter. And, of course, if you would like to support us and what we're doing and, and make it so that we can continue to produce rad content, get better equipment and shit like that, please do go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn. That's patreon.com slash owls at dawn. There's a link down below uh, as well that you can click on. So thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Troy, for opening up this wonderful book with me. Thank you, dude. This has been great. Yeah, dude. All right. Well, I think that's pretty much it. Unless there's anything else you want to say. Just one more thing I can think of, dude. What's that? Das Vidania Amerikanski. Yeah.